Um, so I need to make, I need to eat some humble pie here because uh, a year after we found this thing, um, I was mourning that I was hoping it had been an ankylosaurid. And I always thought with the tail clubs, they were loads better than nodosaurids. And I actually described nodosaurs as being rather pathetic dinosaurs. And I even referred it to as naughty sores. But in the past few years, as this specimen has become exposed, um, I have to be fully repentant. This is pretty amazing, and I've got a new appreciation for these things. So, oh, and there's also going to be audience participation. You have to say oohs and ahs at the appropriate point. <laughs> so first thing I want you to mention is where did it, where was it found? Um, here's one of these nice Blakey maps showing a North American paleogeography. And this, if you go back in time, 115 million years ago, our specimen's about 112 million. So here's the province of Alberta. You can see most of it's underwater. The town of Fort McMurray at the time, what, what would become, is thoroughly underwater. It's the Clearwater Formation. It's fully marine. And over the past 20 years, we've had several plesiosaurs and two ichthyosaurs from this. So to have a dinosaur was a huge surprise. And to set it in time, um, most of our fossils from southern Alberta come from the last 20 million years of the Cretaceous and things like Ankylosaurus. Um, if you go back in time, here we've got Skeletosaurus so way back in the early Jurassic. Move forward a bit more, you've got Hyaliosaurus. And so our new specimen um, comes from this nice intermediate period about 112 million years ago. For so many years, I've, it's been the nodosaur. I just can't get used to saying Borealopelta, Mark Mitchell. I, anyway, so I'll stay with nodosaur, it's quicker to say. This is what we were presented with in end of March in 2011. The specimen is right below the flag. They put that flag in there saying, don't dig here because there was something good down below. There it is. And so we were there for 17 days, 12 hours every day, getting this thing out. It was a huge task, but we had this massive industrial facility to help us. This is what, if you look a bit closer, this is what saved it. You can see this change in rock texture in the middle. That's this concretion. The animal's lying on his back, the arms and legs are sticking up, and all around it the rock is quite soft, and you can see the grooves where the teeth of the excavator bucket scrape through. But then you get this hard, brittle, resistant concretion. And so this not only saved it during it discovery, getting struck by a giant excavating machine, but it also kept it from being squished after being um, buried for 112 million years. So these are the pieces he first saw. A concretion grew around the carcass very quickly, it must have been within days after death. And it's about 40 centimeters thick, and um, it blocked permineralization. It's not your average dinosaur fossil. And the bones actually represent planes of weakness. So these are the, the osteoderms just above the sacral region, and that's what split, and we got part and counterpart. It fell down the cliff, and that's what they saw. And in fact, they'd actually been digging, they took away the tail before they realized what they had. It was probably 100% intact. Um, so but I'm, still, I'm still glad we got the front part, not just the tail. So I need, up until the time, up to March 6, 2011, they tell us that they shifted 1.3 billion cubic meters of rock in this mine. And, but let's say it's a billion to keep the math simple. So imagine a volume of rock Take each cube 10 meters on a side, you stack them up, you get a kilometer uh, uh, around. That's a, a billion cubic meters is a, a block of rock, a kilometer on, on all sides. You could roughly squeeze our ankylosaur, nodosaur, I should say, um, down to just over a, a cubic meter. So this thing really is one in a billion. And at the time, for the other mine on the other side of the valley, as I mentioned, we keep getting, um, every two or three years, we get a marine reptile. And we were thinking, great, in this mine, now everybody knows what to look for. In the past six years, nothing. So it really is, a, we think it's a reflection of the ancient geography and how carcasses were distributed in the shallow bay that determined how things became preserved. Uh, the, Caleb produced this nice diagram highlighting, because uh, you can't always show it with a photograph, but we've got this amazing detail of all the armor in place. It's because it was buried on his back, he went into the seabed with quite a bit of force. You could see an impact crater almost in the cliff wall and how the sediments were deflected and how other things were, the sediments were covering it up. 
Um, there were trace fossils in the rocks just below, various scolithos and, and uh, uh, burrowing things, but the carcass was not disturbed in any way. Um, there was no molestation. I think it's because the hide of these things must have been so thick to hold all that osteoderm, so much connective tissue, that it just, nothing was uh, messing with it. There, there was plesiosaurs, we know there was sharks there. Um, it was probably pliosaurs, but we haven't got any physical evidence yet. But anyway, it wasn't, it wasn't affected at all. The only damage came to the body, I think when gas pressure ruptured the body wall, the thing went down like a stone and it went to the seabed in a nice, nice, nice state. Um, at this stage, I have to say something about um, Mark Mitchell. Um, his absolutely heroic job he did, because it goes from this unbelievably nasty concretion on the outside to this unmineralized bone. Um, Mark describes it as compressed talcum powder. When you see photos of the specimen, you have to think, he went over that whole thing with a, like a one millimeter tungsten carbide rod sharpened, and he had to put a drop of glue on every square millimeter to, to stabilize it. It's, it was quite amazing. Um, this is what, this is an early stage. You can see the details just starting to emerge. Um, when we were there on site, we knew it was good, it had the potential to be good, but we had no idea just how amazing it was going to be. And I think one of the reasons it's as good as it is is how good a job Mark did on this. It's, it's really amazing. So here's a nice view. Um, you can see down the bottom there, we always had a little icon. Um, for the longest time, I was hoping it was an ankylosaur, but any ankylosaur ed. But um, this little character shows up in all the pictures. So you, as you can see, the top part is the best preserved. Um, I'm assuming I've got a laser. Um, it is a teeny bit squished. That's the neural spines got pushed through the midline gap in, in the armor. Um, the top of the head got a bit dished in. Um, the body's a little bit flattened, and you'll notice some of the spines are pressed out to the sides a bit. There was a little bit of compaction, but not much. But the nice thing is you can still see all the relationships between rib, armor, squamation. All those nice associations are still preserved quite nicely. Um, Caleb was the, I'm more interested in the, the deposition and how it became to be a fossil. Caleb's more interested in systematics, so he, he did this for us. And we wanted to compare how it matches with other known members of Ankylosauria. As you can see, um, this is just a guesstimate. Um, all this does exist, but it's still in the mine. Within hours of it being discovered, it was quickly buried under rubble. Um, so. Some if someone's got infinite resources, you can go back and start sifting through many tons of rubble. You can find the rest of the specimen, but it just wasn't practical. Um, we were told at the time we had three weeks to get this specimen out before the company starts losing money. And um, that place goes 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And um, so we had this huge pressure uh, to get it out. That was, that was a major cloud hanging over us the whole time. I want to say something about, so not just the nice exterior part. Um, we've actually got internal stuff as well. We have what's now stomach content. We just got the thin sections made uh, last week and we've had, to ha had started to have a look. Um, we can recognize broken up plant fragments. We've got sperm pharyngea with the, sp the spores right inside. And so fortunately we've got a palynologist on staff at the museum. So we're going to have him try and identify the ferns and we can get an idea of exactly what species of fern this thing was eating. I think there's other types of plant material in there as well. We can zoom in on this a bit. So the volume of the stomach is about the size of a football, but it's collapsed down. The animal's lying on its back, all that viscera collapsed, and you, this stomach mass is resting against the ventral side of, of uh, posterior dorsal vertebrae. And that's another uh, look in. These aren't, these aren't uh, gastroliths. These are actually rimmed grains that have grown around. Um, I think this is all diagenetic after death. It's not a reflection of gastroliths or seeds or something in, in the gut. It's diagenetic. Um, I'll have more to say about this next year. And I'm aiming to get the paper done, be submitted before December. Um, we want to strike while the iron's hot here. So the class are all floating free. I think if it was something that had collapsed immediately after death, all these things would be in contact with each other, but they're not. So I think this is purely diagenetic. 
They're all about one to two centimeters uh, in diameter as well. There was a paper that came out earlier this year or last year about gut content of a stegosaur. Our stuff is quite similar to that stuff that was reported from the stegosaur. So we've had several restorations done. Um, Bob Nichols, we, we got him to do one, one for us once the picture of this animal would become a bit clearer. And you'll notice they've, our co-author Jakob Winter is Mr. Melanin, that's his fossil melanin, his specialty, and he identified um, the, the, the breakdown components of the melanin, and he was arguing that this thing was uniform brown color. And um, I'll come back to that story later. Our great hope was that we could use CT scanning to look inside this, this uh, shape because the armor is so well preserved, we really can't see the skeleton. And um, so we thought, yeah, we'll CT, CT scan it. My other great hope was we could have the original fossil and then beside that have a 3D printed skeleton. That would look amazing. But it's absolutely opaque when it comes to CT technology. We got a little peak the tip of the snout, you can just start to see nasal vestibule, and then everything was to scatter and impermeable. So maybe come back in 10 years, CT technology will have improved, algorithms for cleaning up scattered signals might have improved, but this was a huge disappointment that we didn't get uh, an, uh, an internal view. Just that, I just mentioned that. So as I mentioned, this color. So below you can see there's this nice uh, model that Bob Nichols did, again working with Jacob and it's another brown, completely brown dinosaur. This, I, this can't be right. Uh, I'm gonna differ with um, Jacob on this. Um, so we've got two very different dinosaurs. Yes, they're from the early Cretaceous, but they're living in completely different habitats. Would they really have the same monochrome colors? I don't think we're getting the true pigment signature here. If you look at modern diapsids, we know they've all got color vision. They've got at least, even if you look in the crocodilian case, um, he's not super colorful, but he's got banding and different patches of color. Um, I think there's more to the color patterns in dinosaurs than just monochrome. Yep. So, monochrome dinosaur, come on. I think we, there's, we still have more to learn about the color in dinosaurs, and um, I think you have to wait and see how the, the science is going to improve as we come along with that. So, I just have to acknowledge the people. The, for, the Suncor company, just immediately before this thing was found, um, they had really bad press because a whole bunch of wa waterfowl perished in their settling ponds at the mine. And they couldn't ask for a better PR rescue. And it obviously came up high up in the company, spare no expense to get this thing out and exploit it for everything they could. Um, the people on the ground, I've listed them there, they're the geology people, their department um, went out of their way to help us and the amount of help we got from all the people there, it was truly an amazing experience. Um, physically and mentally draining, but um, we got this amazing specimen and I'm sure there'll be loads more you'll hear about this in, in the future and I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>